Hey everyone, welcome to the May meeting. We have uh, Toronto's only three Sakura Blossoms on the screen there. <laughs> but summer's here now, so that's good, right? It just it came too late for the, for the cherry blossoms. So as always, we'll start off going around the room, saying hi, say our name, what we do with Java, and then, uh, you know, after Jack's talk, we'll go through the black curtain and socialize with each other over beers or other tasty beverages. And uh, housekeeping, uh, we have a mailing list, which you can join and post something to for the, probably the first time in 12 months. Uh, we also have the meetup, which is a lot more alive. Uh, that's probably the best way to get meeting announcements at this point. And we also now have a Slack organization that Angelo, no, Mike. Mike set it up, but yeah, I've got a man too. Cool. So if you want to join the T-Jug Slack, talk to Angelo. <laughs> it's kind of like IRC, but worth billions of dollars. Yeah. Value that. Exactly. <laughs> Value that. Good point. It's, 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 it's the emojis. That's what's with the yes, IRC with emojis. All right. So. Exactly. You just need the magical terminal that knows what they mean. So, yeah, check out our videos. We record almost every meeting, uh, this one included. So you can watch it later if you forget what happened. <laughs> uh, and we have job postings that are heavily filtered, as always. Um, let's see what today's not posted job of the, of the day is. Just a minute. A bunch of Florida. Yep. There's one. Uh, let's see, how far back do we have to go? Oh, we have to go back to 6.18 PM for the last job that wasn't posted. <laughs> It is immediate interview, technical business analyst in Los Angeles, California for six months plus. So that, that job will not appear on, on the Toronto Java jobs mailing list. Wait, don't, no Java jobs in Guatemala? I mean, not yet. I really no. We could set up a separate mailing list for you. All right. So if you like reading books on dead trees or, or on e-readers, then uh, use this code, PCBW, to get your O'Reilly books at a discount. Java news. Some things happened, especially something happened today. <laughs> That's right. For those who don't know, uh, hot off the press today, a uh, jury in the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that Google's use of Java APIs in Android are fair use. So as we know, the, the previous chapter in this series of lawsuits was um, that uh, Oracle successfully overturned California court's decision and said APIs are subject to copyright. But uh, now the higher court of appeal has, uh, by jury has unanimously decided that uh, just, you know, I think, I think the, the winning uh, analogy for the case was that if you go to a restaurant and there's a hamburger on the menu, it's okay for another restaurant to describe their hamburger in the same way as long as they're not sneaking into the kitchen and copying the recipe. <laughs> so the jury unanimously decided that was a, a valid example of fair use. Yeah. So that, I guess that means by, by extension, the, the structure, sequence, and organization of a Big Mac is, is fair use. Uh, and Google vows to appeal, according to the article in Ars Technica. So I don't know where they're going. Right, yeah, they won. Oh, Oracle. Oracle. Google will not. <laughs> Google will not. I was multitasking when I wrote that. <laughs> there, I fixed it. That's better. Google's happy with the verdict. Picture says Google there, so maybe that's what you did. Yeah, that's probably what happened. I found this. I found this image. I th 
on TwitPic from like 2010 or whenever that website started. This was from Java One, the the, the like uh, the tent outside what is it, the Mason Street Cafe. Um, Google had pulled out completely from Java One that year. They sent no speakers, even though they had a bunch of speaking slots. And uh, the only Google presence at the whole thing was this like third-party company they had hired to bring a bunch of Lego to the <laughs> Mason Street Cafe. And that showed up. It was probably an oversight uh, that they forgot to cancel it. So um, <laughs> I built these. I built a little android and a duke with a heart in between them and <laughs> left that as my artifact. <laughs> So I, f I found that picture. I thought it was lost forever, but it was on TwitPic. All right, JDK 9 build 120 just came out. So it uh, has 198 fixes versus the previous build. I didn't list them all because there's a lot of them. It's coming. You can't stop it. You shouldn't want to. So <laughs> run all of your tests on it tomorrow because we're here now and probably won't do any work later. See? There? You need, maybe it is on build 120. They fixed 198 problems. There you go. Oh, did they make the compiler, the private compiler APIs more private? The browser? No, that's gone now. It's, it should, should have been gone long ago. There were uh, like 10 swing fixes in there. That swing is still supported. It's just the browser plugin that's not. Uh, so the DevOps Belgium CFP is open. You should submit something. Their headline topic is deep learning, but you can submit on any Java-related topic. And I think this is the last one. Uh, there was an interesting series of, of posts on Voxed.com uh, where Mario Fusco deconstructed uh, probably like half of the Gang of Four patterns from the, from the Design Patterns book uh, and showed how using functions you can solve the same problems in a cleaner way. So it's an interesting read, especially if you want to like, get a flavor for how you could transform some common object-oriented patterns into functional patterns. Oh, there was one more. So this jug, we did the adopt the JSR thing with um, the JSON processing API. And uh, our main feedback, especially Mike's feedback, was uh, why doesn't it have object binding? So this was part two of that that adds the object binding. So now it does everything Jackson could already do before the first one started. Jackson? Nothing. Uh, actually, the Jackson author was on the expert group for the first one. I think he might be on this one, too. So has anyone checked this out yet? It's, it's still pretty fresh. but. It's been on GitHub for a while, so no. Well, if you care about standardized JSON binding, then check it out. Anything else? I don't know if this is news, but uh, I was mucking around with the JUnit 5 mm. last week. So it adds support for a bunch of the Java 8 features in, into JUnit. So like default method, uh, methods on interfaces can, can now be annotated as tests. And actually run. Uh, they have a bunch of Lambda-based tests. So you can do like uh, uh, assert all and then have a bunch of suppliers that each supplies a, 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 an assertion. It's really, mm. really kind of neat. Uh, That's cool. I like that. Relatively new, but I don't know that it's news this week. It may be the topic of an is upcoming it, presentation. Is it breaking other stuff? Or is it uh, yeah, the IDE support for the previous ones don't really recognize the test. There's a bunch of edge cases, but the Maven build works, that sort of thing. So. Very cool. Anything else? There's yeah? The Groovy conference uh, in July. It's going to be like great all over Nice. Minneapolis? Cool. That's not too bad to get to. So Google I.O. was they premiered Android Studio 2.2, which is 
which is going to be the first Android Studio that uses 1.8. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah, that was news from a previous one that uh, Android's going to 1.8, right? Yeah, so. it's going to be the first one. And they, get, they put a whole bunch of people like performance tools, and uh, they have, uh, they improve their Instagram features, and they put other stuff, and they, uh, they compile, yeah, so they do the uh, 1.8 features. And they did it, they saw the chatter at the presentation they did on it for Google I.O. But yeah, and they have, oh, the other thing you can do now is, uh, I don't know if anybody knows what Espresso is. Yeah, but it's a, it's a UI uh, testing framework for Android. They now actually made a, uh, an automatic espresso tester. So you can sit there and you can push all your buttons mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And it will record everything. Wow. And then it will actually build an espresso like test. And then it will uh, build an espresso test case for you. Nice. That sounds great. Excellent. Oh, more JCP blowups? Yeah. Interesting. I didn't see that one. Okay. There was one last month that we talked about uh, some JCP conspiracy theories. Okay. Yeah, we should look into that and report on it next month. Cool. All right. Time for Jack's talk. All right. I guess I'm going to unplug you. All right. So, like any presentation, you got to start with a pithy quote. Sorry it's so long. How are you doing? Good? Good. And the takeaway here is our, t our system of time is bizarre. It has so many weird exceptions, and the units are strange. They don't line up properly. It's just hard to deal with, and that's why in many APIs, time is handled in very strange ways and inconsistent ways. Um, who am I? Um, I'm a team lead in Teleware for about eight years. Um, we do agile, uh, agile project, software project delivery. Um, I have 20 years in IT, including a stint doing COBOL Y2K work on mainframes as a co-op student. So I, I have a diverse set of experiences. Um, Teleware has been around for 25 years. Um, we do Agile. A lot of people do Agile now, but I'd say our big differentiator is that we've been doing it for a while, so we don't, we don't slavishly follow any one methodology. We just we do what we think works in terms of practices, and the engineering stuff is the most important stuff, in our opinion. Getting that nailed is way more important than the rituals. So that's us. So today's goals. Um, I want people to... Uh, understand time better. Uh, we suffered through an awful set of time zone bugs in a project last fall. And uh, the solution ended up being refactoring the entire thing to get rid of Java Util date, because it was causing so many problems. Um, we used JSR 3.10, because we were on Java 8, fortunately. Um, and uh, the whole, whole experience led to a much deeper understanding of date and time concepts. And I want to share that with you guys today. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, we include a flux capacitor with uh, every presentation. Um, I'm going to go through uh, relevance, like why should you care. Um, a little pop quiz to see if people know what the, the legacy Java Util Date stuff does, um, why it's broken, um, a re-education session, which will be gentle. Uh, I'll go through the replacements, um, some refactoring notes, and uh, a couple of concrete things with databases and JSON, which are two of the most common integration things you have to do with dates and times. And I believe it's one of the biggest holdups for people because it's just not obvious what to do. Um, so why should you care? Um, if you're in Java 8, great. It's in the core API. If you're not in Java 8, it's OK, because um, there's a backport that goes back as far as Java 6. The API is almost identical. There's a few things that work differently because of the Java 8 language features not being available back then, but they've approximated pretty well. Um, if you're back as far as Java 5, there's still Jota Time, um, which has been around since Java 3. Um, Java 4 and B, I hope you're not in Java 4. <laughs> um, so pop quiz, how do you set the time zone on a Java Util date? Can anybody answer that for me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I, I heard Dan over here. He said he said it. It's, it's a, a system property, right? Yeah. So it's a trick question. You can't. It always inherits the time zone from the system. 
You have no control over it. The system decides for you. That's part of the problem with Java Util Date is that if you do a two-string on Java Util Date, it tells you something involving a time zone. It doesn't tell you where it got it from. It just assumes it for you in a very friendly way. Um, <laughs> um, you can set the time zone on a calendar, but if you actually pull the date back out of that calendar afterwards, there's still the time zone on it. It didn't care. Um, you can set it on your formatter, but not the constructor. You have to construct your formatter first and then apply a time zone afterwards. So after all that, you can finally format your date in the time zone you wanted, but you're just formatting it. Because if you serialize those calendars and dates back, they lose their time zone again. So it's not very good. Oh, yes. The dolly clocks, always important. Um, so why is it broken? Um, first of all, naming. A date, Javi till date's not a date. It's an instant. It's the number of seconds or milliseconds since the epoch. It has nothing to do with, with, with dates, like human readable dates anyway. Um, and a calendar is not a calendar. A calendar is like a wrapper around a date for doing date math and setting arbitrary human readable date fields. And I think you can apply a time zone and a locale too if you want to. Um, they're not mutable, so you can actually change the value of a date after you've instantiated it, which makes it really, really bad for doing multi-threaded programming. Um, it's formatting implicitly assumes a time zone for you without telling you. Um, it's got the classic zero-based month index. Everyone's probably experienced that, where January is zero, February is one, <laughs> March is two. And uh, it's just, it, it performs poorly. The like, calendar takes up 450 bytes, it takes a while to construct one, and it's not thread safe. So you, you have to, if you're doing, you have to basically make a new one every time you want to do something. It's just really, really inefficient. Simple date format isn't thread safe either. The yes. formatters aren't even thread safe, yeah. which has burned me. <laughs> yeah. um, it's also incomplete. There's lots of time concepts that you can't express properly in the legacy date and time API. I can't express setting an alarm clock. I can't express my birthday. I can't express um, uh, the length of this presentation. I can't express probation length at my company. None of these things have objects which represent those concepts. So as a result, people just use primitives to represent these things. And it's just very inconvenient. Another one I've done is credit card expiry dates. Oh, yes, that's a partial. That's a, a year month. Mm -hmm. and, and that. Without a time zone. Without a time zone. But year month is available in JSR 310. Yeah. And then you can, do, you can do date math on it afterwards, too. And nice. it does it properly. Yeah. And so the, the question on my mind is well, why don't we change? And personally, why didn't I change? And I think that the big reasons are um, external interfaces, JSON and JDBC work fairly well, and they expect Java Util dates by default. And the other one is human nature. I think that we avoid complexity until it bites us in the ass, and then we have to go ahead and change and try to comprehend what's going on. Um, so, but, and a lot, a lot of people will see the JSR 310 API, and they see a bunch of things that it's just gobbledygook. It's like, why do I need to know all that? All I want to do is just express the time in France. And it's got a lot of stuff in it. So I think that in order to understand the API, you have to be comfortable with the underlying concept. So, um, I'm going to attempt to educate you guys on the concepts, and then we'll go into the API afterwards so you can see how it works. So we're going to go through uh, UTC, um, offset versus time zone, uh, timelines, instance. Well, you can see them all there. There's eight of them. So let's get to it. Everyone's heard of UTC, right? It stands for Coordinated Universal Time. It's um, actually a compromise between English and French. It's not CUT or TUC, it's UTC, because they didn't want to name it based on you know, whether it's an English or French speaker, which I thought was kind of cute. It's not a time zone, it's a time standard. All of our time zones are based on it, it never changes. There's no daylight savings or anything, it's always, it's invariant. So everything else is based off of it. So time zones and offsets, offsets are a number. Like right now in Toronto, we're minus four, I think. We're in EDT. Um, the op offsets are, they don't change, they're just numbers. Time zones, on the other hand, like America and New York, do change. So we flip back and forth between minus five and minus four, depending on what time of year we're in. Um, people also see time zones expressed as three character codes. Um, they're deprecated because they're ambiguous. There's more than one EST and more than one CST out there, so you can't know what people are talking about when you use that expression. They're also confusing, too, because people call them time zones, yet they don't change. EST doesn't have daylight savings. It's always minus five. But people call it a time zone, and they say, what about DST? And confusion ensues. Um, also, GMT is a time zone. It happens to be the same as UTC, but they're not the same thing. GMT is actually a time zone, you know, London. Well, sorry, London in the winter. 
Yeah. So. Pardon? Yeah, Greenwich, Greenwich Mean Time. Yeah. Um, so like I was saying before, there's ambiguity. There's four different CSTs in the world. So if someone comes at you with that and says, what, what offset am I in? You have no idea because you can't know. Um, it's also, there's ambiguity there with, with EST and EDT. Those are both observed in America and New York. So I would submit that they're not really time zones. They're symbolic representations of numeric offsets. It's a better way of looking at it. So with timelines, um, there's machine timeline, human timeline. The machine timeline is continuous. Since the epoch, it just marches forwards. On the other hand, humans, because we have, I don't know, energy savings or farmer things going on, we have these gaps and overlaps happening with uh, daylight savings time. Um, there are some days of the year where 1.30 happens twice. There are some days where 2.30 never happened. Um, and you have, to, you have to account for that in your programming. The API handles that in JSR 310. But in a lot of cases, people avoid the API entirely and try to do their own clever date math and get it wrong, because they can't remember all the exceptions. Does that include um, leap seconds? It or? does not. So those are part of UTC? I don't think Java cares about leap seconds. Okay. I looked into that a little bit, and it seemed like they just ignore it. I see. So I'm not sure how to handle that when it happens, but it's. Plus and minus, so probably. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I, I saw that. Um, so what's an instant? Um, it's, it's based on the epoch, which most people know is uh, January 1st, 1970 at 12 AM. Um, back in 32-bit land, that meant that the world ended in 2038. But now they were in 64-bit <laughs> land. You can go on until, I don't know when, a long time from now. Um, it's the machine timeline, like I was saying before. And it's commonly expressed in seconds, millis, or nanos, depending on what data types you're using. Um, so JSR 310 and Jota have the concept of a local date. And people can say, what do you mean local date? It's a date without a time, and therefore without a time zone. And it's good for things like my birthday, or sorry, uh, sorry, a date of birth. Um, she's like a good, yeah, a date of birth has a year. Um, a legal date or a business date. So you think about, I want the uh, report for some stock thing for January 3rd, 1942. It's, if you express that without a time or a time zone, there's no ambiguity. If you, if you ship that date across the wire and serialize it and deserialize it, there's nothing else in there that might cause it to flip forwards or backwards a day. So you actually want to be able to express these things without using, if you use a real, use a Java utility to express that, you might unintentionally change your date just by transporting it over a serialization. Um, similar to local date, there's local time. Um, good examples are the time you see on a wall clock or your alarm clock. Um, the example I like to give is if I go travel to Paris tomorrow and I want to wake up at 6.30, I don't have to reprogram my phone. It knows I'm in Paris now, and it just wakes you at 6.30. It's 6.30 local time. It's the time in whatever time zone you're in. Um, there's the concept of a local date time, and that's uh, the date and time where you're physically located. Like the tea jug on May 26th, 2016 is at 6.30. We don't have to say it's in Eastern Standard Time, America, New York, because it's in this location. No one's dialing in. There's no satellite link. People know to show up at 6.30. There's no, you don't, you're not required to give a time zone. Um, birthday party, wedding service, things where there's, you know, everyone's local. But then there's the idea of a time zone date time where there are people involved that don't know which time zone we're talking about. Like your conference call with Hong Kong or a World Cup soccer game. These things are happening and more than one time zone is tuning in. Now you actually do care. Um, as humans, we tend to express this um, in hours, minutes, seconds, not in terms of like a giant number that you can't comprehend. So they're not continuous. It's to be careful about that. And you can also, you can tr always transform a time zone date time back into an instant if you want to. You can do math these things. Um, if you have a time zone date time, oh sorry, if you have an instant and a time zone, you can make a time zone date time. If you have a local date time and a time zone, you can also make a time zone date time. Um, you can add two local, local date and local time together to get a local date time. And a lot of these types, if you add intervals to them, you end up getting the same thing back again. So wait, I don't, maybe you said it. I don't, I don't know what an instant is yet. Um, an instant is, well, it's a Java util date is an instant. It's the number, oh, okay. it's the number, of, number of milliseconds since the epoch. Got it. So if you add an interval to that, you'll get back an instant again. Mm -hmm. There's no, there's no time zone in it because an instance always expressed in terms of UTC. Got it. Uh, but it's the same, same as 
same time worldwide. Yes. Instant happens around the world at the exact same time. Yeah. And in fact, I was thinking about databases the other day. If you feed an instant into a database, the database doesn't care what, t what time zone it's in. It's the, it's the same instant regardless of the time zone. So whatever, whatever time zone your server is on for your database, it shouldn't care. It's still the same thing. It's still in terms of UTC. So that's all the concepts. Did, you guys, did I blast through that too fast, or did you guys follow all that? OK, so we know the concepts now. So let's look and see what Jabby till date gets replaced with. Um, JSR 3.10 started getting authored in around Java 6, but didn't get completed until Java 8. Um, all of its types are immutable. Um, if you want to modify a Java util or sorry, a JSR 3.10 date, you can, you can create a new one based on an old one, but you can't modify the existing one. Um, it's got the idea of uh, partials and instance partials and intervals. Partials are things like a year month or a month day, and even a local date or a local time are examples of a partial. They're just components of a full date. Um, it's got explicit time zone handling, which means that it'll never make an assumption about what time zone you mean. If you want a time zone, you have to ask for it, which might seem to be a bit inconvenient at first. But on the other hand, you have full control now, and you won't accidentally get the wrong time zone, which is nice. Um, it's a replacement for Jota time, which um, it's been around for about 10 years. Um, it had a couple minor issues. One of them was if you passed a null to a Jota time constructor, you'd get back an actual date. Which was, <laughs> which was kind of inconvenient if, yeah, oops. So they fixed that problem. It's the same author for both, actually. So he basically took Jota and made it slightly better. Date is null. <laughs> he just assumed null was zero in the original implementation. And it, that, uh, could, that uh, can cause problems. Like 1970. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> it's just that it, sometimes null coming through your thing is a, is a problem. And you want to know about it. And it would just silently eat that null and keep on going, which is, can cause bugs. <laughs> <laughs> there's no worm. There's no wormholes here. <laughs> so yeah, how do you choose? I think I kind of hinted at this already. Um, if you're in Java 8, it's in the core API. If you're in 6 or 7, use the backport. And if you're in 5 or less, use Jota. Um, yeah. So the the first thing I'm going to introduce is instant. Um, it has an equivalent in legacy Java. It's, that's what Java util date is. It's also an instant. It's, no one really knows that because it's a date. It's called a date and yeah. expresses itself with a time zone, but it's really just an instant. Um, it's got nanosecond resolution in the new API, but you have there's utility, um, there's methods which you can basically pull it out whatever whatever units you want. Um, and if you add a time zone to one of these things, you'll get back a zone date time or an offset date time. So there's some quick examples. I used that today in a test I was writing. Yeah? I wanted to prove that a thing waited long enough, so I used instant.now instead of new date before and after. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What was the question? Oh, I was just saying I used that instant.now thing in a test I wrote today to prove that a test it was testing code that was supposed to sleep for a certain amount of time. And I thought, well, it's Java 8, so I'm not using new date. And that makes it done now. So I talk about local date, like my birthday or uh, business date. Um, it has no equivalent in legacy Java. Um, but this one does have date math support, so you can make a local date and then start adding and removing stuff to it. And you can use this to construct other aspects of dates. So it's a pretty natural API. You can construct one. You can ask questions about whether it's before or after something, extract some interesting trivia from the dates, and you know, add, add some intervals to it. Oh, there's a get one. That's good. You can do between the Yeah, I think so. I didn't cover that, but yeah. And two is February. I see a new find bugs rule coming up. What? Oh, to eliminate? If you use like Gregorian calendar dot February, <laughs> that'll be one. Yeah, no, that's true. That's true. But you should. I think that find bugs should just detect every time you use Gregorian calendar or Java till date and flag it as, a, as an error and make you fix it right. if you remove it. Right. Um, local times is very similar to local date. Um, it's got the same basic construction. 
um, only when you're adding intervals to it. It's hours, minutes, seconds, as opposed to days, months, years. And local date time, again, there's no legacy Java equivalent. But you can now construct. Well, so this is interesting. It is kind of assuming a time zone here. When you ask for a local date time now, it's giving you the local date time in your time zone, mm. which kind of makes sense. Because so that's kind of how Java Util Date behaves. So, so here's a question. Um, what happens if I enter one of those times that happens twice? So if you, the so first one or the second one? Actually, we're going to get to that. All right. I think, it, I think it makes an assumption, but you can be explicit and ask for one or the other. Okay. The second one thirty. Yeah. They're, they're, it's in there. It's in there. They thought of that. So there's zone date time. This is the one where it's like a symbolic offset, which has DST transitions. So you're going to express this thing in terms of like America, New York, or Europe, Berlin. And you notice it's not using that EST or GMT or BST thing. Does it's zone ID dot of throw a checked exception. I believe it. Well, I think it's a runtime exception. Yeah. Okay. Uh, not, 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 well, are they the same pretty thing? Sure it's checked. Pretty sure. Seems like the Java. Because I remember being irritated by it. It's not that long. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you had to, to put it in your signature? Yeah. Okay. Well, try catch. Seems yeah, like, yeah. Seems like the character set lookup problem where. Yeah. If you pass in an arbitrary string, there might not be such a character set, even though you put UTF-8, yep. which is always yep. there. Yeah. So you can, you, can you can take an existing zone date time, transform into a different zone date time by asking for same instant, different time zone. Um, there's all kinds of cool things you can do, and that's just some of them. Um, you have the list of those. Like, you have the list of those time zones? Um, the way I figured it, you can actually ask it to dump out the list for you. You could just say zone ID, get me all of them, and just that's how I figured out which ones were which. Oh, it just. So no like so I'm not. I'm not sure where it gets it from. I'm not sure if it's reading it off the system or if it actually has them embedded in the some properties file. It comes with the JDK. Yeah. Or the JRE, and I know this because every single JDK update we've announced at this group for the last five years, one of the things on the list is that they've updated the time zone database. Oh. OK. So. <laughs> so are they pulling that from, is ISO publishing stuff and then Java no, is pulling it in? No, or? There's, a whole, there's a thing. Dan's got the story. It's a, it's a, there's a very <laughs> shady political backstory to the whole thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm fuzzy on it now. Like, there's a whole, um, it's maintained it's, by a couple of people. Yeah, and there, there was a company who came up with the format for some like shareware calendar app that they made a long, long time ago. But it was a really good format, so people started using it. But uh, what was it, like three or four years ago, that company suddenly like asserted that they owned the format that all of that stuff it was, was like in. It's like a Grayscale kind of thing. Yeah. Everything in the world uses that format. And, and <laughs> they, it's like IMDb or something. They, like they don't, that's the opposite of IMDb. Like they, they don't update all that stuff anymore. It's done by the world. And they're like, <laughs> actually, we own all of this stuff, so <laughs> you're all sued. <laughs> uh, it got fixed, but it was. Uh, Did they make millions? No, no. I hope not. No, there was, there was uh, a threat to like not have it available anymore. Uh, right. It became unavailable for a short period of time. Yeah, I, I think see. they did that to get attention. Yeah. Uh, it backfired. So, so it's free now. Good. So the example I thrown up here is uh, one of the things that, that surprised me when I was looking through this stuff is that the offsets between different, oh, sorry, the, the time when your daylight savings transition occurs can be different depending on which time zone you're in. So. In this example here, London and New York are not always five hours apart. There's a nice short two-week period where they're four hours apart. And then they go back to being five hours apart again. And it's just something which, you know, I was debugging something a few years ago, and I was convinced there was a bug in the API because it was showing me a four-hour difference. But it, it actually was a real thing, um, which I found really surprising. Yeah. And it also depends on which year you're asking about. Yes, because they keep changing the rules and when the transitions occur. That's absolutely true. The yes. transitions occur in different. There's a really cool website called timeanddate.com, which has, it's like a clearinghouse for everything. It's got a nice, clean design. You can punch in any time zone you want. It's actually really, really good. Oh, yeah, that's cool. That's a really interesting question, though. What happens if you ask the time in a time zone that used to exist?
exist before it existed. Like, I'm, I'm assuming it just does the math. And, and then you meet yourself. <laughs> Should you annihilate each other? Yes. Yeah. There's, some kind of, there's some kind of singularity, I know. That'll happen probably. That actually happened in uh, what was it, one year, uh, Russia, one week before they were supposed to do daylight savings. They dropped it because we're not doing daylight savings this year. And it broke a lot of software. Oh, wow. That's the, you know, we were good because, you know, a lot of things got wrong because they didn't do a whole bunch of pushes to calculate. Wow. Hmm. So after you're done the zone date time, if you don't want DST to be an issue, you can just use offset date time, which is a purely numeric way of expressing um, where you are from UTC. Um, it's not, not as common because most humans think of time, time zones in terms of zone date times. But if you want to do something which you, where you don't want it jumping around on you, use offsets. Same kind of idea. You feed in a, a number instead of a string to move things around. I'm not sure, because there's definitely, like Newfoundland has got a half involved. I'm not sure if it goes below 0.5. I'm, that's a really good question. I didn't, I didn't look into that. So if you use clock and zone ID, what's the difference? Say again? Like zone ID and uh, clock. You can do like uh, clock.utc. Is that the same as uh, zone ID? Well, I mean, uh, zone IDs are, are zones which... More like America. Uh, well, they, they, the difference between the zone IDs and or zone IDs and these offsets, the zone IDs have, da have daylight savings transitions. Okay. The offsets never have transitions. Once you ask for one, it's never going to jump backwards or forwards on you. Whereas the zone IDs, they will change if the zone observes daylight savings. But in the Java time, they also have like the notion of clock. clock dot, like, uh, yes. Something. You can feed in your own clock. That's right. I didn't cover that in this, okay. actually. Okay. I ran out of space. But yeah, you can actually inject your own clock. and. Yeah, you can use that. It's actually really good for testing if you want to change your own times during your tests. Yeah. Yep. Oh, neat. Yeah. That should be part two. Part two, yes. You're hired. <laughs> um, so someone was asking earlier about the, the, the two 130s. So there's actually part of the API where you can ask it. You can, you can specify, I want the earlier offset, or I want the later offset. So classic Java methods. <laughs> oh, wow. Nice. <laughs> so in this oh, case. there's no offset factory. <laughs> <laughs> so in this this case, I got I've, I've got two ident like they're almost identical. They're they're both America New York, but one of them has an offset of four, and one of them has an offset of five, based on the transitions. Um, the other cool thing is if you ask for a non-existent time, I thought to throw an exception, and it doesn't. So if I ask for two thirty on I think is it this morning? No, no. It's if you ask for two thirty on the other side of the transition where, where there's a jump. It just gives you the later hour. It, mm. it, I think that's a bug. I think it should throw an exception if you do that. Let's have a tough call, though, because I mean, if the whole point is, is I'm not supposed to need to know anything about these sorts of transitions, I'm doing some internal math first to get these numbers. Yeah. I'd rather the, the API handle yeah. that for me. should be a mandatory parameter in, rather than a runtime exception, I would say. But like, like the, if, if you want, if you said it's an it's it, and that might be true. It's a bug to not specify which you want. You should have to choose in some way that the compiler can tell you ahead of time that you didn't account for that problem. The other thing I noticed when I was doing this was that if you don't specify that thing, it has to make an assumption, and I can't remember which one it does. It either assumes the earlier or the later, right. but in the old legacy stuff, it assumes the opposite. Oh, uh, <laughs> like Ruby, you assign strict, and then you get the way. That like, gives you an error, or you assign lazy, and then you get the way where it just gives you an error. And then all your sockets die. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> right, and math changes. So of course there's formatting. Um, uh, the difference here is you can actually put a time zone in your formatter if you want to. And it's, I think it's part of the constructor. Um, the cool thing I noticed with the formatting is, is the formatting part is one thing, but the parsing is, is interesting because it uses a new Java 8 feature where you can pass in a static reference to a method. Because you've got this, str you've got this string here, and you're asking to parse it into something, but parse it into what? There's a like bunch of things you could parse it into. So you can actually tell it which, basically pass in a static reference to a method to say, well, get me a local date time, or get me an instant, or get me an offset date time. Um, That's cool. Yeah. So what's the signature of the from is, is that something that takes? takes a bunch of integers, probably. Uh, 
So the parse or the from? The, the method, yeah, the from that you pass in as the second argument of parse. It looked weird, whatever it was. Okay. <laughs> It's like the whole thing just like splayed out. And it might have had an arrow in it. It might look like a <laughs> lambda almost. I, I can't remember what it looked like. I'll have to, to go back and look that up. Um, the, the other example is uh, uh, you, can ask quite, you can ask to do things which will give you a runtime exception. If you ask to parse an in, so that's an instant string there at the bottom, the thing with, with no time zone in it. Um, if you try to turn that into a zone date time by parsing it, it'll, it'll blow up because it's not going to make an assumption about what time zone you're in. So it's going to say no. You could, you, act, you, could, you could do that, but you have to actually you have to, you have to pass it a time zone first to, to, make, to make the assumption for you. So intervals. Um, you can now express intervals, both date-based ones and time-based ones. Um, these are kind of important because they're not always consistent. Everyone's done the, uh, the classic thing where they've got the magic number, 86,400 seconds in a day or, or 86 million milliseconds. Um, if you do that, you end up getting tripped up on those daylight savings days. So instead of doing that, just use a duration. Say, I want a duration of, of one day. Or a, I don't know if it's a period. Duration and period are the two types. One of them is about hours, minutes, seconds. One of them is about days, months, years. Days but you can, well, days are not always the same length. A month is not always 30 days. A year is not always. So basically, all these things are not really constants. They have to be work, to worked out. But you can capture these things with, with periods and durations, and it's much cleaner. Um, I've got the zero it out thing in here. It actually doesn't belong here. It belongs in the, in the database section. But I've seen this so many times where people try to zero out their dates and then s s insert that in their database. But it might get transformed all over the wire and then end up having a plus 5 or a minus 5 in your time component. So it's totally pointless to do this. You shouldn't be doing this ever in your code because it has no meaning because that date is still going to have a time component after it gets converted over to UTC or whatever time zone you're in. So duration is like a is an interval which is based on um, time. So hours, minutes, seconds, milliseconds. So it goes well with local times. It goes well with local date times. Um, basically, for adding hours, minutes, seconds. Um, but you can. But the the thing is here, you can capture duration. If I actually want to say I want a duration of two hours, it's not just like a a string in your code. It's actually an object you're, you can pass around and serialize and stuff like that. And different, the other thing is a period where it's a day-based interval. And periods are cool because they don't, they don't always add to the same number of hours, minutes, seconds, depending on, on what, uh, what, what uh, time of year. So a month isn't always 30 days, or it could be 28, or it could be 31. It depends on what, what context it's in. So you can ask for the, the, the length between a first date and a second date there at the top. Um, you can extract different aspects of the period. That's a nice, easy, expressive API. That's cool. um, it does have some cool edge cases, like February. If you ask for to go one month after certain days in February, it gets well, it gets confused. But it has to make an assumption: how long is a month? Because if you ask for, if you ask it to add a month to um, January 27th, it makes sense. But as adding a month to January 30th, what's it supposed to do? So it makes the assumption, OK, I think you meant end of month. So you do get different lengths there. Um, and then putting it all together, you can do a bunch of transformations. In this one, I'm making a local date time out of a local date and a local time. And I'm assigning a time zone to it. Um, my daughter was born. Um, about 7.30 in the morning in America, which is 11.30 in UTC, but it's a certain other time over in Australia. Um, and I called my cousin over there 20 minutes after she was born. Um, you can see it's really easy to transform between the different time zones and instance. Um, domain driven design is pretty hot right now. Everyone's happy with this. Um, they're good domain driven design because they, they follow most of the guidelines. Um, they're they're They've got equality. They express a measurement. You can't change them. There's no side effects. They're good domain-driven design value objects. <laughs> so in refactoring the code base last fall I was working on, one of the biggest challenges was interpreting what the intent of the test was that I was refactoring. Because 
just eliminating Java Util date and putting in instance or local date times, it, couldn't, it wasn't really something you could do automatically. You had to go through it line by line to figure out what was the intent of this test. Because in a lot of cases, it was, in some cases the test was, getting, get, was completely wrong. But by, by enforcing stricter data types, you had to actually figure out, well, what, the, what does this test really mean? Um, I think that banning the use of the old types is a good plan. I don't know how to achieve that, but there's probably some kind of plugin for your IDE you can use to, to catch when you're using simple date format, calendar, so, so date. Fine plugs at least, you can write your own tests so, so right. Right. And it, it may seem crazy, but I think getting rid of it is the, is the safest thing to do. Because the, the new one is much easier to use, and you'll trip yourself up less. Um, also, just understanding instant versus local date. Like A lot of people blindly jump in and start trying to do things with them, not knowing what they are. And you can get yourself into trouble, because they're not meant to, like for example, you can't turn an instant into a local date. It's just not, it can't be done. But people try to do that. If you go on, go on Stack Overflow, um, and well, I'll get back to it in a second. Um, JavaScript, I should really mention, um, fat clients becoming more important. JavaScript has its own idea of dates and times. You've got to serialize between your browser and your server to communicate. You have to be really careful and understand, well, what's my client really mean here? And make sure your serialization format either includes the time zone or doesn't. Because there's probably some intent on your client to make sure that when your server receives the data, it's, it's receiving what you meant to, meant to for, receive. Uh, Moment.js is pretty good for formatting and parsing dates in JavaScript. I don't really do much JavaScript, but I've been told the date support in JavaScript is awful. So use Moment.js. So this is a new meme. Have you guys heard of this? The full stack overflow developer? <laughs> <laughs> this is when you're really desperate and you just cut and paste blindly out of stack overflow to achieve your solution. Um, there's no, bad examples. No <laughs> <laughs> There's, there's bad examples out there. I found at least two examples where people were complaining bitterly about these two things. Why can't I turn a local date into an instant? Why can't I turn a local date into a Java until date? Because you're not supposed to. But they managed to find a way to make it happen. They tortured the API until it confessed its sins, and they got it to happen. And it's out there in Stack Overflow. Or out, out, not their stock, but it's out there on these blogs. And if you use these examples, you're going to get your, it's going to be really wrong. <laughs> Yes, if you add to it at a time, at a time zone, it, you can now make it an instant. Yeah. But you have to be you have to be deliberate. You yeah, have you to have you, have, you, you have to mean to do it. You, it won't do it for you. Yeah. So all my pop culture references are like twenty years old or thirty years old. This might be thirty years old. <laughs> So databases. I was in Terminator Has it come full circle? Did it become uncool, then cool again? Yeah, zombies are out. We're back into Arnold Schwarzenegger. So I did a little investigation on databases and how they handle timestamps. And I found that there's no standard behavior across databases. Each driver, like DB2, Oracle, Postgres, they all treat it differently. So the only way to figure out if you're going to get it right or not is to just experiment, write some tests, and figure it out. Um, with Postgres, I found out that when you pass it a timestamp, it turns it into a time zone formatted string and then rips the time zone off and inserts it in the database. Yes. It goes to a lot of trouble to, to, to convert it and then forgets about the time zone. If you read it back in the same time zone, everything's cool. But if you don't, it's going to get it wrong. But really, the, the timestamp in your Java program and the timestamp in your database are already different just because of how the driver handled it. But there is a Postgres timestamp with time zone that does things correctly. But that's not the one everyone uses because no one knows it exists. Anyhow, that's just Postgres. I'm sure it's different for every single database. In the it's a data type with spaces in this thing. Weird. It's true, yeah. yeah. The parser has to understand. Yeah, it's true. There's a few like that in, uh, in SQL. There are, yeah. Timestamp with time zone is one of them. And it's not really a timestamp with time zone either. It's really the driver shall respect your time zone and convert to UTC when inserted into the database. Because the data type and the timestamp with time, stamp with time zone data type is not actually store a time zone. It's exactly the same length as the, as the other one, which means it's not storing, it has no room to store one. It's just interpreting it in the driver. Interesting. Yeah, so it's actually badly named. Hmm. Um, keeping with databases, um, 
JDBC drivers, unfortunately, most of them still see the world in terms of SQL, Java SQL types. Um, the good thing is that they actually work properly. They don't get confused about time zones, and they actually make the right call. Um, if you want to write ORM classes that use the new types, it's OK. You can easily convert back and forth, because there's convenience methods on the new API to get back into the old ones. So no problem. And then JDBC will hopefully catch up the next generation of drivers. There's, there's also uh, static methods on at least in JavaSQL bait and possibly the others. Uh, where you can do uh, JavaSQL date dot of global date time as the argument, and you'll get the SQL date. Time. Yeah, yeah. So th there is yeah, you can, in both directions. You can convert back and forth, yeah, because I mean, you're going you're gonna, you're gonna to have to do that if you're going to go in and out of the database. You're going to have to be able to go both ways. So I'll show you guys an example of that in a minute, like a, a GPA converter. Um, with your ORM layers, uh, Hibernate 5 supports the new types already. If you're going to be using 4, you have to use some conversion code. Do you like another beer? Um, I tried using Hibernate user types recently, and I was uh, impressed by how ugly they are. Do you guys remember that? It's got all these things. You've got you to gotta have this giant thing and, and implement. But it's like 20 methods. It's ugly as sin. Yeah. But JPA 2.1 has this awesome converter syntax, which is like super light. It's every, everything you need. And so I would not use the Hibernate user types. I'm not even bother putting them in here. Um, a JPA converter, you basically subclass attribute converter, tell it what you're converting to and from, and then tell it how to go back and forth. So in this case, I'm doing a local date and converting between local date and SQL date. And there's a convert to database column and convert to entity attribute. And then you just annotate your, uh, annotate your, your, um, your fields with the converter, and then it does it right for you. So easy peasy. JSON's the other big thing people have to integrate with. Um, Jackson has a JSR 310 POM thing you can bring in, in your Maven uh, in, in your POM file. Um, you can feed it global serialization rules. You can just tell it what to do by default. Like the ones I've seen are write date as timestamp, write dates with zone ID. Um, you can do that in your Spring config or on the on the object mapper, um, or you can just write your own custom serialization logic if you have some really special case you want to deal with. So. Um, I've written a, this is what you would, serial, this is how you would serialize your, your object. Oh, so this is how you would annotate your object for serialization. And then a custom, custom date serializer looks something like this, where you just tell it how to, form, tell it how to format the thing when you're writing stuff out to your, uh, to your JSON, uh, JSON string. And you would do something similar for the deserialize step as well. But I think realistically, the, the default behavior is pretty good. And I think that sticking with that is probably the best thing to do. And that's kind of it. There's a bunch of references in here. And uh, thank you. Um. So you got any questions about dates and times or questions about IntelliWare? Just we'll talk. Thanks.